We can expect an unimaginable time of trouble in the last days, such as the world has never seen before. That's what Scripture tells us. But we need not be afraid. His word shaping our story. The year was August 1948, and a young preacher, George Vandeman, was preparing to take the pulpit. As he did so, a Sabbath hush fell over the new grounds as members mixed gratitude with happy hearts for the work accomplished and for their new auditorium. That was 70 years ago, and Central California Conference continues the legacy of Soquel Camp Meeting today. Soquel, an embodiment of America's camp meeting, has become a timeless tradition of faith intersecting with culture, pleasure bursting with praise, and truth uniting with tradition. It is camp meeting time once again. We invite you to join us as we worship our Creator together and let our stories and the stories that are yet to come be shaped yet again. Good morning, saints. How's everybody doing this morning? We're blessed. All right. Wow, this is a powerful mic. Let's see if we can wake up some more people in the camp this morning. So, uh, I'm a pastor at uh, the Sunnyside Seventh-day Adventist Church in Fresno, California. And I'm going to see if I can get this clicker to work, because I have some information I need to share on it. Maybe I'm pushing the wrong button. I don't think so. There we go. Nice. Okay. I think it went up several. There we go. All right. We're good now. So, um, back to the first one. Here we go. So let me just tell you a little bit about myself as we set the stage for the message that, that I have to share today. I grew up less than 15 miles from here. Anybody here ever heard of Monterey Bay Academy? Anybody here ever been to Monterey Bay Academy? My parents uh, were teachers first in Mount Ellis Academy in Montana, Bozeman. I was born in Bozeman, Montana. Then when I was, the summer I turned five, we moved to Monterey Bay Academy. And so re really that's the place where I grew up because my parents stayed there for 30 years. And so from the age of five, I grew up on the Monterey Bay Academy campus. I'm a product of Adventist education. I went to VHM. Anybody ever heard of VHM? Virgil Hazel Memorial Junior Academy here in Santa Cruz. That's also just a few miles from here. So this is my, this is my stopping grounds. Um, I went from there to Monterey Bay Academy. I was a faculty brat, lived at home, and went to school at MBA. And then I was off to Pacific Union College. When I graduated from PUC, I um, ended up getting a job, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And then I went to Andrews University. And so my experience is very much steeped and grounded in Adventist education. I'm a fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist on my dad's side. I'm very thankful for the call porter that knocked on a door in a little town um, called Houston, Minnesota. You thought I was going to say Texas, didn't you? Houston, Minnesota. In fact, it's a little, a little area just outside of town. They called it Swede Bottom because it was a little valley that Swedish farmers lived on. And my family had come from Sweden. And a, a call porter knocked on the door. My great-grandmother, Christine Nelson. Uh, guess what religion she was at the time? Came from Sweden. Any guesses? Lutheran. Lutheran. She was Lutheran. Somebody knocked on the door, left literature, started Bible studies. She became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, had 10 children, the oldest being my grandpa. And so grandfather, then father, and then passed on to me. Fourth generation on my dad's side. On my mom's side, fifth generation. Um, Ever heard of John Loughborough? John Loughborough and Daniel T. Bordeaux, the first missionaries, Adventist missionaries to California at the beck, at the beck and call of uh, Merritt Kellogg. Uh, in, he was in San Francisco and invited uh, missionaries to come. The third series of meetings that took place up in the Santa Rosa area, my great-great-granduncle Seth attended. I guess it's my great-granduncle Seth attended. And he then shared it with his brother, who is my great-great-grandfather, great -grandf James Bond. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's for real. 
the first James Bond, before Ian Fleming ever came up with the idea. So James Bond hears this message from Seth Bond, isn't sure about it. Start, in fact, Seth kept talking about the Sabbath over and over again, and finally Sarah, my great-great-grandmother, told Seth, you're welcome to come visit your brother anytime you want, but stop talking about this Sabbath business. He left literature, my grandfather read that literature, and became convicted and decided he was going to keep the Sabbath. And he and Sarah started up a conversation. They studied the Bible. She said, well, I'm just going to show you where you're wrong. And so they started reading the Bible through. And by the time that story's done, they both were keeping the Sabbath. They also had 10 kids. My um, great-grandfather, Elmer Bond, became a uh, doctor, helped to start the work in Hanford, um, th with the Spanish work in Hanford. Um, James Bond helped to start the English work in Hanford even before that. Some of the missionaries, some of the family members, I don't know if you've ever heard of C. Lester Bond. You heard of C. Lester Bond? He's one of the founders of Pathfinders and MB. He's a, he is a brother of all those Bond kids. And so I have this, this legacy that, that's come down to, to, my, to my life. I decided to be a religion education major when I went to PUC. By the time I was done, I got a Bachelor of Arts in Theology with pastoral emphasis. So I took a class in pastoral ministry. I fell in love with, with that whole thing, discipleship and small groups and working with the body of Christ. The, the local church is a place where disciples are developed, right? And, and I was excited about that uh, possibility of being a pastor. And, and so I graduated with that major. However, before I graduated, I had an interview, because you got to get a job. It's one thing to have a degree, but you also got to get a job to connect with that, right? So I interviewed with the Central California Conference. Anybody heard of Charles Cook? Charles Cook was the president. Uh, David Taylor, I can't remember what his job was. Bob Zamora, I believe, was ministerial director. And Daryl Retzer was the executive secretary. What would that leave for David Taylor? I don't remember for sure. But anyway, those four guys were sitting in the president's office when I interviewed. Oh, it was going, going swimmingly. I was on a roll. They knew my parents. I had good grades. They were throwing me softball, slow pitch softball questions. I, was, I felt, really, felt, felt really good. I was nervous, but I felt really confident about how things were going. And then came the question. The question I wasn't ready for. They asked me this. So Jerry, what is the mission? And I remember it. I don't have to read it on the screen because I remember this so clearly. What is the mission and message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church as it relates to the three angels' messages? How would you guys do if you got that question asked? I hope you'd do better than I did. I had graduated with a degree in theology from Pacific Union College, and I was struggling to answer that question. They felt sorry for me. I remember, I remember it so clearly. This is a very vivid memory in my, in my young life. They were like pitching, like, you know, the everlasting, you know, the everlasting gospel. That's right, yeah. And, and, you know, fear God. I mean, they were trying so hard to help me out, you know, spotting me answers, give me an opportunity. I utterly failed answering that question. They moved on to a couple other things. I wandered out of the president's office, very discouraged. I remember Daryl Retzer walked me to the door and put his arm around me and told me I should go to Marie Callender's and get a piece of pie. So that's what I did. I felt really bad. I was shocked when I got a phone call from Central California Conference inviting me to become a pastor in Central California Conference. Now, I know some of you may be worried. What does that say about our leadership? But listen to this. This is what they do. Well, this is what they did. Before I finished my senior year, they gave me a packet of 21st century Bible studies. You ever heard of those? And they said, just go through these. They also gave me a unique assignment. They assigned me to work with the conference evangelist, who at that time was Richard Pollard. I don't know if anybody's old enough here to remember Richard Pollard. Richard Pollard was the conference evangelist, the singing evangelist, and they assigned me to work with him. So for the next six months, I had the privilege of listening to this 
powerful preacher share messages connected to the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. I remember sharing that interview and telling people later about that interview. And I remember people feeling sorry for me, and I remember them thinking that it was kind of ridiculous that they put this pressure on me with that question. And I remember when I first would share that with people, I kind of thought it was ridiculous too. It's like, why are they putting so much emphasis on this? I don't think it's ridiculous now. I have come to believe that it's very important that not just our pastors, but that our members have an understanding of the mission and message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church as it relates to the three angels' messages. Anybody else believe that here? I would like to invite you to pray with me as we get into the Word of God this morning. Father God, thank you so much for the privilege of speaking with the saints here this morning. I thank you for these faithful ones that have come out um, in the mornings, 6.30 in the morning, not only to receive the Word, but also to offer support and encouragement to the pastors. Lord, I ask that you would be with me as we now turn to your Word. Be with us. Open our hearts and our minds that we may have a clear understanding of the message you have for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 10. I want to share this in a way that, that hopefully will help us understand why I've come to believe that it's not ridiculous for us to expect that we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians have an understanding of the prophetic message of this church. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 10. The passage begins, then I, saw another, I, then I saw another mighty angel coming from heaven. What I want to do is quickly just see if we can quickly identify who this mighty angel is. It's not just an ordinary angel. This is a mighty angel. And what, one thing we're going to find is that this mighty angel is very similar to the man in linen that's spoken of in Daniel 10 and Daniel 12. I don't know if some of you may remember when John Pauline was preaching earlier in the week, he specifically talked about um, allusions between places in the book of Revelation and other places in the Old Testament. And he said the, the one place that has the most allusions is Revelation 10 connect, connected to Revelation to Daniel 12. Revelation 10 to Daniel 12. We're going to take a look and do some comparing on those today. But very quickly, let's go through. I want you to get an understanding of who this mighty message is. One thing it says is that it's robed in a cloud. My question to you is, what's the last image that the disciples had in their mind of Jesus when they saw him physically? What's the last, the last impression they had? Wow. Seeing Jesus being enveloped in a cloud. So we find this mighty messenger is robed in a cloud. There's also a rainbow above his head. Can you think of a place in the Bible that describes a rainbow somehow above something. Revelation chapter 5, we find that there is the emerald rainbow that's above the throne of God. What else? We find that this being has a face like the sun. What does that make us think of? If we go to Matthew chapter 17 and verse 2, we see that Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration not only had clothes that were white, but he had a face that was like the sun. We also have in um, Revelation chapter 1, the very first chapter of the, of the revelation of Jesus Christ, we see that it speaks of this being who is referred to as the Son of Man, referred to as the first and the last, referred to as the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive. Who's that talking about? Who's the Son of Man that was dead and is now alive? It's very obvious. It's very clear. It's Jesus. His face was like the sun. So we have good evidence or support for the idea that this, this mighty messenger in Revelation 10 is none other than the Son of God, the Son of Man, the first and the last, the one who was dead that is alive. Also, it says that he had legs who were like fiery pillars. Legs like fiery pillars. That makes us think, if you think of pillars of fire, doesn't that take us back to the Exodus? 
Who does the Bible tell us led the children of Israel through the wilderness with the rock? We know that the Lord, that Christ, Jehovah, was leading the children of Israel, and he led them with a cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. So what else does this say? It goes on in, in verse 2, and it says that this being was holding a little scroll in his hand. Now, the word, the Greek word for book is biblos. We get the word Bible. When we say Bible, we're really saying book. People of the book. People of the Bible. People of the biblos. The word biblion is, would be a diminutive form, and it's the idea of a little book. This is not the word that is being used in Revelation 10. The actual word that's used in Revelation 10 is Bibla, Bibla, Biblaridion, Bibleridion, which means a little, little book, or it could be parts of a, of a little book. Interesting. So what we want to do today is try to figure out what this little scroll is that's laid open in his hand. What is this little scroll that apparently used to be sealed? We find that it's open on his hand, which gives the implication that at one point it was sealed. It was a sealed at one point, and now it's open. Let's see if we can identify this little, little scroll. Daniel chapter 8, verses 13 and 14, we read this. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, and listen to this question, how long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? The vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, the surrender of the sanctuary, and the trampling underfoot of the Lord's people. He said to me, how long will it take? Let me hear it, folks. 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be, will be reconsecrated or cleansed, vindicated, restored. It's interesting that this question is being asked, how long? This is a common thing that we're going to see in Daniel and Revelation. How long? And then we find that it specifically, this vision specifically relates to evenings and mornings. Now let's do a quick review together. I think it's helpful, as I've mentioned, I think it's important for us to understand the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. That's really the heart of what I'm wanting to share today. I'm wanting to encourage us to dig deeper, to be more solid. Spirit of Prophecy specifically tells us that it is important for us to understand, especially the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. So let's go through them. Daniel chapter 2. What is Daniel chapter 2? What do we see in our minds when we think of Daniel chapter 2? We have an image, a metal image. We have a head of representing Babylon. Head of gold representing Babylon. We have chest and arms of representing Medo-Persia. We have the belly and thighs of Bronze or brass representing Greece. We have the legs of iron representing Rome. Oh, you guys are good. We have the feet of iron and clay, same metal, that should be a hint, representing what? Division of Europe, or we see the divided Roman Empire. We can also see there's some people that will make a connection with clay to Jeremiah, the potter's clay, or also in Isaiah, where clay is likened to the church. So we see kind of a combination of state and church there represented by the feet of iron and clay. What's the next thing that happens? We have a stone cut out without hands representing Jesus and his coming kingdom, which smashes the image on the feet. The whole thing is pulverized, turned into little specks and particles, and the wind blows it away, then that, imp, that stone grows and fills the whole earth, and how long does it last? Forever. Lasts forever. All right, let's jump to chapter 7. Chapter 7, we have now images that are beasts, and these are unclean beasts. What is the first beast that Daniel sees in his vision? He sees a lion. Lion representing Babylon. Then he sees a bear with three horns, I mean, excuse me, three um, ribs in his mouth, representing, what does the bear represent? Medo-Persia, it's tipped up on one side. Uh, then we have, what's, what comes next? We have the leopard with how many heads? Four heads, representing Greece, right? You guys doing okay? You're a little weaker on Daniel 7 than you were on Daniel 2, right? 
Um, so then what comes next? What's the next animal? What are we gonna call it? It's a terrifying beast. We'll refer to it maybe as a dragon. That word is not used, but Revelation helps us to see that it's kind of, kind of like a dragon, some kind of terrifying or ferocious beast with iron, beast with iron teeth. This is a representation of what, of what, uh, of what empire? The Roman Empire. How many, how many uh, horns do we see on the head? Ten. Ten. How many toes do I have? Ten. Ten. So we see ten horns, then what happens? Something is added. Now we see a little horn that comes up and it removes how many of the ten original horns? Three are removed. That little horn, then how long does that little horn reign? Time, times, and half a time, otherwise known as 1260 days, 42 months, that we interpret as years, right? The next thing that comes is judgment. We see we see that the Ancient of Days is approached by the Son of Man who comes, and we see that he enters into his presence. We see that thrones are, are set and books are opened, and we see a judgment, and judgment goes against the little horn power that has been persecuting the people of God. Are we good? And then we find that the little horn power that is oppressing is destroyed, and the kingdom is given to the saints, right? All right, so we got that. Then we go to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, we're going to skip the first empire of Babylon because even the vision itself, Daniel's vision, he sees himself already in, in Persia, in Susa. And so we're going to skip Babylon, but we have a ram. The ram represents what power? Medo-Persia, very good. Come on, let's be strong because we, we're getting into, the, getting into Daniel 8. So th what comes next? What is, the, what is the beast that approaches the ram? It's a goat. And how many horns does the goat have? Start. Starts with one, very good. We start with one horn. Then that one horn breaks off and how many horns come up in its place? Four horns. How many, how many heads did the leopard have? Four, so we see the four horns remind us of which power? Greece. Alexander the Great does not leave his empire to any, uh, any offspring, but rather it's divided amongst generals. Uh, then what do we have? We have a little horn that we find uh, coming out of one of the, the winds of heaven. That's a really important thing to understand that. It's not coming out of a horn. It's coming out of the north. In fact, we find, if you look at what, it, what the Bible says in Daniel 8, we find that this little horn moves towards the east, towards the south, and towards the beautiful land, which would be the west. That only leaves one direction. If it's moving west, east, and south, where is it coming from? North. Where did, where did Rome attack Medo-Persia from? From the north. And so we see this little power this little horn power moves first in a horizontal direction, then we find that it moves in a vertical direction and actually attacks the sanctuary of God and casts the, the host to heaven. People that are there by faith are cast. Instead of looking to heaven, people begin looking horizontally to a fake system that is set up that is really seeking to be a replacement for the heavenly sanctuary and the ministry that Jesus is doing. So we find the daily ministry, the continual ministry of Jesus is negatively affected by this power that seeks to ultimately be a replacement for it, an anti-Christ power, a replacement. All right, then we find that it comes to, it, we, we end up with a vision that specifically talks about how long? See, the question that Daniel asks is, how long, O oh Lord? And this is where we get to this question. How long will it take for this vision to be fulfilled? The vision concerning the daily. The word sacrifice shouldn't even be in there. It's added. The daily is the continual ministry of Jesus, offering his blood to us constantly. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Okay, are we doing okay? So, the rebellion that causes desolation the surrender of the sanctuary and the trampling underfoot of the Lord's people. How long, he's asking. And the answer is it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated, cleansed, vindicated, restored. Now, look at this. The vision of the evenings and mornings that has been given you is true, but seal up the vision for it concerns the distant future. So that, remember, the evenings and mornings is the 2,300 evenings and mornings, right? 
And it is this part which we're specifically reading here is being sealed up. Do you get that? The vision of the evening and morning is sealed up for it concerns the distant future. I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. Then I got up and I went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision and it was beyond understanding. He didn't understand it. It was sealed up. God's not going to give him the answer yet. There's many reasons why God might want to keep that secret. If you reveal the enemy too soon, when the enemy has actual control of the manuscripts, those manuscripts might disappear. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right, let's go to, we're going to jump back now in Daniel 8, and look at this. As he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified, and I fell prostrate. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns what time? The time of the end. So we're told that this vision will be sealed up because it relates to the time of the end. He said, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. So get in your mind that the 2300 day or evenings and mornings, which we see or translate or understand to represent years, this vision concerns the time of the end and is sealed up until the time of the end. Okay? Moving on. Let's go now to Revelation of Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12, we read this. But you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the what? Time of the end. So this is after Daniel chapter 10, 11, where we find the fourth prophecy, Daniel 2, 7, 8, and now we find one more that's this vision that covers the same ground again. It again covers Medo-Persia, Medo Greece, Rome, and then comes down to the very kingdom of God where we see Michael standing up. That's at the beginning of Daniel 12. Michael standing up to come and rescue his people. And there's going to be a great time of trouble that takes place at that time. But now it says here, but you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. So we find another. This is the second time in the book of Daniel that he is told to roll up the words of the scroll until the time of the, min, uh, of the end. And then it says many will go here and there to increase knowledge. And we will sometimes interpret that to understand the incredible knowledge expanse that's taking place in our lifetime. It might be better understood as a running to and fro. If I just was over in Israel just a few, uh, two weeks ago. And the table that they use in synagogues to study the, the scrolls is long because they roll the scroll out and then they'll run from here to here. Oh, this verse says this over here. And then they run back over here. Do you get it? Running to and fro to gain knowledge, to study, to try to understand the prophecies in the last days. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. Notice that this... This man in linen in Revelation, this again is the same man that was shown in Daniel chapter 10 that is very similar to this man that we have seen, this son of man that we've seen in Revelation 10. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, how long, you see that question again, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and I heard him swear by him. Now remember, this is Daniel 12, but I want you to notice these things because you're going to find similarities in Revelation 10 that we're returning to in a moment. He lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, it will be for how long? A time, times, and half a time. Okay, we already saw that in Daniel chapter 7. I heard, but I did not understand, so I asked, my Lord, what will be the outcome of all this? He replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are, are what? Rolled up and sealed until what time? Ta the time of the end. So here's what I need just to understand. <clears throat> the two things that are sealed up are specific time prophecies. The 2300 evenings and mornings and the time, times, and half a time. The 1260, the 2300 are sealed until the time of the end. Something that for hundreds of years people can't understand because it's sealed. The reality is this one cannot be unsealed until it ends. That's what we find. Sometimes we, we will use the date 798 for the end of the 1260. And people will criticize and say, how, how do you do that when you start with the end? 
You should have started with the beginning. Oh, this must be the beginning of it. No, it's not until it ends that we are, we're able to really grasp and understand. Look at this, chapter 12, verse 10. Many will be purified, made spotless and wise, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. Do you want to be wise this morning, folks? So what you want is to have a longing to understand the message that God has for us. Let's go back to Revelation 10 now. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. Now look at the, notice the similarities to what we just read in Revelation 12. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Remember how the man in linen in Revelation 12 was above the waters. And he's right there on the river bank. Here we see that it's a bigger context. We're not just talking about by a river. We're talking about a foot on the sea and a foot on the earth with his hands up to heaven. That pretty much covers it, doesn't it? We think about, if, if you think about everything that's in our world, you're either on land, you're on sea, or you're in the sky. He's covering it. We see this universal me message that's coming. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. Reminds me of the lion of the tribe of Judah. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven th thunders spoke, <clears throat> I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, Seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. So we find something here that is hidden. Do you realize, folks, that God does not lie, but he sometimes has secrets? Did Jesus have secrets from his disciples? Yes. He said, there are some things that you will not understand. I don't want to share more than you can bear. God is wise. What if the disciples knew at that time that it was going to be, that I'd be standing here preaching in 2018. Would that have negatively impacted the sense of urgency and mission that they had at that time? God is so wise. He is so good to us. This is one of the reasons why things were sealed. If they would have been understood, people would have said, oh, wow, we've got hundreds of years. I'm going to kick back and have a nice, lukewarm glass of Laodicean tea. Right? So wh what about these seven thunders? We're not going to spend a long time, just a minute on this. Look at this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to a passage that I believe this is re um, referring to. You can study it yourself. If you go to, you might want to write this down, Psalm 29. Why do I say that? Well, let's look at the beginning of it. First it says, ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Where are these beings from? heaven. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Does this remind anybody of the first angel's message? Does it? Look at that. Worship the Lord. Ascribe glory to his name. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made. Okay, do we see that context? Now look what comes next. I want you to count with me. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord is, breaks the cedars. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. How many voices of the Lord do you see? Count them for me. It's seven, right? Seven thunder voices. But then look at the context of where it goes next. I believe that, it, that the Millerite movement, had they looked more closely at the seven thunders, maybe they wouldn't have missed what they missed. The big problem that the, that the Advent movement had was a misunderstanding of what the sanctuary was, right? They thought the sanctuary was the earth. Where did they get that idea? Do you realize that they got that in a, in a large part to the teaching of Augustine, of Augustine, St. Augustine, the city of God, talked about the sanctuary being the earth. This was a commonly held or understood view, but it's not biblical. That's the danger. The Lord sits in, now look at this, what it says, and in his temple all cry glory. So the focus of these seven thunders now is God's presence. Where is God? He is in his temple. Where was God at the time that the Millerite movement were studying the Bible? Where was God? Was he over in, in a temple in Jerusalem on earth? No. That temple had been destroyed. What temple would it be referring to? It's referring to God's temple where he reigns and dwells. 
The earth is his footstool, but God is enthroned in heaven. Look what it goes on. It says, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. So I believe in that little hidden message, God is giving them an opportunity to understand, don't focus on the sanctuary on earth. Focus on the sanctuary that is in heaven. But God didn't write it down. And again, I believe that God has his reasons for his secrets. God could have, in Revelation 10, could have specifically told them, don't confuse the earthly sanctuary with the heavenly sanctuary. Couldn't he have said that and solved the problem just with one sentence? He could have done that, couldn't he? Why didn't he? Well, here's one, there's several reasons, but one of the things I want to point out is that at the time of the Millerite movement, there was a large group of Christianity that was post-millennial. They believed there was going to be a thousand years of peace. They're living in kind of the era of industrial revolution. Things are getting better expansive knowledge and technology and industry. And many people were believing there's going to be a thousand years of peace and then Jesus would come. At the end of the Millerite movement, that idea was really relegated to the trash heap. You'll find very few people even today that believe in a post-millennial view that Jesus comes at the end of a thousand years. There are some, but it used to be a large portion. Now, almost all Christians are premillennial. The Advent movement had a great part in doing that. And I believe that God was wanting to reestablish the truth of the timing of the second advent. So, continuing on. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven. Remember what we, what we had read before? And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in them, and the sea and all that is in them. What, is, what does that verse come from? What is that pointing to? Fourth commandment, right? Remember, remember the Sabbath day? Six days shalt thy labor? And why? Because he created, he is the one who created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it. And he said, there will be no more delay. So what I want you to remember is from Revelation, or Daniel 12, let's look at it real quick. Daniel 12, it was time, times, and half a time comes after this right hand and this left hand goes towards heaven. Do you see that? So you have this, this being in Revelation 12 that speaks something, and then he speaks of a time prophecy of time, times, and half a time. But now in Revelation 10, we see that it's time after the time, times, and half a time. Because he also raises his hand towards heaven, but he says there will be no more chronos. There will be no more time. So we find that this is during the time when we are now in the time of the end. There are no more time prophecies. They have been fulfilled. Let's continue on. Re Daniel 12, 7, the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river lifted his right hand. Okay, no, no, let, me skip, let me skip beyond that. We, that's what we were just looking at. So what I, go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. So now we see that Revelation 10 is in the context of the time of the end. So here's my question to us today. Then the voice that I had heard from the heavens spoke to me once more. Go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. The question is, what should we do with a little open scroll. What should we do? So I went to the angel and I asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and do what? Eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. Now we give a historical application to this in the sense that this took place at a time that the Advent believers had a misunderstanding. They took the prophecies of Daniel they took the prophecies of Revelation, they studied them, they came to a certain understanding, and as they studied those prophecies and ate those prophecies, studied those words so it became just a part of who they were, it was sweet in their mouth, but it certainly became sour in their stomach when things didn't turn out the way they had expected. Do you believe that we should just read Revelation 10 and leave it, relegate, relegate it to history? It's just something that happened in the past. Should we apply it to ourselves today? Does God still want his people to take the little open scroll and eat it? Yes? God wants us to study and understand the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Think about the, the unique privilege and responsibility of having an understanding about the, the time times half a time and the 
evenings and mornings. Do you realize that there is no other people on the face of the earth that have an understanding of these two prophecies? That gives a, a sense of responsibility because God is calling this message to be shared in the last days. We should take that open scroll, study it, and though it may, we may get persecuted. Maybe that's the sourness that we experience now. We study, it's sweet in our mouth, it's sweet to our taste. But as we share it with others, maybe we're rejected. Does it bother anybody, people that drive past and honk their horn at 5.30 in the morning? Those are just little ways that people sometimes will persecute people that believe differently than they do. Verse 10, I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and I ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned power. Then I was told, you must prophesy again to, it says in some translations, or about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So as soon as the, as soon as you are eating that scroll, that little scroll, that understanding of these end time prophecies. God wants us to share it again with people, nations, language, tribes, tongues, people. He wants us to share it with the world. So now I want to do something that I think is really cool. The 1260 year prophecy is floating. The 2300 year prophecy is locked in place by the 70 week prophecy that's locked in place by Jesus Christ, amen? We have the 70 week prophecy that's locked in with Jesus three and a half years ministry, he dies in the middle of the week. Three and a half years later, the message begins to go to the Gentiles. That locks in the 490, which locks in the 2300, takes us to 1844. If you add, if you take the 2300 and you start at the same time as the 490, you end up at 1844. But it's interesting, the 1260, how do we know the 1260 is supposed to be starting at 1798 and going back to 538? How do we know? I want to show you something really cool that God gives us in Daniel chapter 12. Look at this. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1290 days. This is the very last two verses of Daniel 12. 1290 days. If we go back... 30 more years from 1260. Now we're at 1290, right? Go back 30 more years. 508. Something very significant happens in 508. You have really the Aryan powers. The tribes were largely Aryan. But you now have Clovis, the king of the Franks in France, rises to power. And he begins the process of uprooting the three little horns, or the three horns that are uprooted that we talk about in Daniel 7. So what happens is a national religion begins in 508 when Clovis is recognized for the work that he has done to establish the Catholic Church. You see, Aryan powers had greater power until what Clovis does shifts the balance of power towards the Catholic Church, allowing the Catholic Church to begin its reign of 1290 years. Then it says, so if we take 1290, if we just go back 30 years, we're at 508 instead of 538. The 1260 would be 538 to, 12, to 1798. If we go back 30 years, it's 508 to 1798. What about the 1335? Look at what it says here. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the what? What's that next word? Help me out. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1335. I talked to my professor, Richard Davidson, at the seminary and asked him if this is a good trans translation. He said it is. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1335. Do the math. If you go 1335 years from 508, it takes you to 1843. But what the prophecy says is blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end. So at the end of 1843, what comes? 1844. Do you see the power of these prophecies, the 1260 and the 2300 are now locked in place through this mathematical genius verse? Do you see that? This is something that helps us to understand that we are on solid ground and we need to eat this message we need to absorb it. 
understand it so that we as a people can share it with our family and our friends. Flash forward to my second year of Master of Divinity Studies at Andrews University. Remember my embarrassing interview that I had with Charles Cook and co? Two years later, Master of Divinity Studies, I had another interview. This time it was for a job at the Siri Seventh-day Adventist Church. Dick Donaldson was the pastor. He came out to interview me. He sat in my Daniel class. And he was sitting right there when Gerhard Hazel was passing back the final test. And he passed it out, he was passing it out, and he said, I've got one test here that I wanted to mention. This is the highest score I've ever given on my Daniel test. And then he came to my desk and he set it on my desk. That was a big moment for me. I don't consider myself to be an expert. But what I am saying is that I went from not understanding very much about prophecy at all to having the highest grade in that Daniel class that year. You know, that, that's not, I don't want it to sound like I'm bragging, but I'm saying that it, that's a, that is growth for me, that I grew to have an understanding of the prophecies that I believe God wants us to understand. Folks, in the last days, when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. What is the mystery of God that God's wanting to do? Colossians 1 tells us this. Look down here in verse 26. It says, The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed, disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's a beautiful thought to realize that God is wanting to purge and purify us through the wisdom and understanding of the times that we're living in and the work that he's wanting to do in our life. These messages allow us to have a greater appreciation for the prophecies than ever before. We are closer today to Jesus coming than we've ever been. And we have a clear understanding of these messages that God has given us. My challenge to each and every one of us is that we would study them and that we would allow God to do what he's planning to do. It's the last scripture. Daniel 12 says this. Go your way, Daniel. I'm inviting you this morning. Go your way. Because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. The time of the end has come. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined. But the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand. But those who are wise will understand. Are you willing to allow Jesus to do that purging, purifying work in your life? Not that we separate and isolate ourselves, but that we would receive from Jesus that cloak of his righteousness. As it says in Revelation 19, the, the, the linen garment that he gives us is the righteous acts of the saints. It's not about our works, because remember, it is a gift from Jesus. Let Jesus give you his righteousness. Let him give you an understanding of his scripture. And may we go forward faithfully to share the message that he has given us to share with the world. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you so much this morning for the patience of the saints. Through my fumbling and struggling, they have patiently listened. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to each heart. Give us a, a burden and a, a deep desire to study, to learn, that we might be faithful in prophesying again before many people. And Lord, we're also asking that you would do a great work of purifying and purging us. May you who has begun a good work, may you complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in the name of our precious Savior and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. You guys have a beautiful Sabbath. We would like to thank the constituency of the Central California Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for making this program possible and from viewers just like you. Thank you.